Cool. Then I would uh, uh, introduce the other speaker, um, Perry Peterson from, from Canada, from Pixis and University of Calgary. Hi, Perry. Hey. Perry is also a member in the OGC DGGS week working group. The floor is yours, Perry. Yeah, thank you very much. And thanks for having me here. I'm glad you could bring together some folks. So I've been working in the field of developing discrete global grid systems since about 2002. So a long time. And um, uh, I'm really all I really want to do today is demonstrate the ICA 3H um, in an application. It's, we, when we're dealing with DGGSs, we're often focusing on the geometry, what kind of shape and how we construct them. It's kind of interesting, you know, to build these things. But if we want to, we don't want to lose sight of why we're creating these. And so I thought maybe I would just start out by just talking a little bit about that, if you don't mind. You know, um, uh, in a lot of ways, um, the conventional way of uh, partitioning information is really good. Uh, GIS has helped us slice information into themes and, uh, and for many years, it's been good enough for us to, to try to model through that as GIS professionals to provide spatial analysis. But uh, as we know, you know we, we have to operate really um, uh, complex pieces of software and processes in order to combine that data back together, uh, often is scale dependent. We have to understand the different data formats and we can be criticized because those people that really are asking the questions um, have to come to us, the intermediary, in order to answer their spatial questions. So one of the things, the primary purpose behind the development of DGGS, why they were des designed, is for data integration. Data integration is a free operation when you quantize and sample conventional data, you don't have to you know, adopt anything new, conventional vector and raster based coverage data is binned into the cells of the DGGS. And once the data values are in the DGGS, then the fun happens. So uh, I'm just gonna demonstrate that today and, and open the floor. If people have questions, um, we can, you know, I can take them on the fly. I, th I think we have about 20, 25 minutes, maybe longer. It's, it's past midnight here today and I taught all day and I have another, another set of classes tomorrow morning in a few hours. So I may fade a bit, but uh, bear with me and I'll just uh, share my screen. I think you'll have to enable my share screen. Can I? It'll be in under your green button. Yeah. Wait, I think everybody was, I think, allowed. Perry, where are you here? Perry? Uh, hi, Alexander. Uh, hi. I think that you, I'm uh, from local organizing committee. Yeah. I think that you have to uh, make Mr. Peterson a uh, co host. Co -host. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I have it on here. Okay, here. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Pete, uh, yeah, Perry, you're now co host. So now you should be able to share. Okay, wonderful. Okay, let's see what happens here. So you should be seeing a globe up on your screen. Yes. Uh, one of the things I, I'm, because I've been dealing with this for 20 years now, um, I forget that we see these pictures of the, the grids and uh, I'm gonna put the ICA 3H on here. And we kind of think that, that there's big cells, but the DGGS, it, the, the cells that we're talking about are, are, are really small. I'm gonna zoom down here on a place on the earth. And in this particular application, um, it, the smallest cell that you see right there contains, is addressing about 256 cells. And there's 2 million cells being addressed on my screen right now. And the distance between the cells is two millimeters. Okay. So these are tiny cells. We're oversampling data often. And so I'm just gonna zoom back out again. So these are tiny cells or pixels. We're pixelating data values um, 
from conventional data sources, we're bidding those data into the cells. So I'm going to start with, um, you know, common data set. I'm going to start with some elevations. So these elevations are coming in from different services. Um, basic, uh, this one is uh, GTOPOS 30. So some of you may be familiar with that. I'm going to take these, this picture of the cells off because it doesn't really help us. Um, so I'll just turn those off. So we're, we're still looking at the DGGS here. And if I uh, right click on a cell, it tells me it's querying the cell, it says 2,865 meters. So this is a uh, land cover, TG Topos 30 doesn't cover the ocean. So I can come you know, into this area in Europe and you know, I can do the same thing here, elevation 17 meters. Holy, you guys get flooded out a lot there in Estonia. You may get some elevation on you there. Okay, so, so we can see that th that's pretty simple. Now this data is being streamed in. So it's being queried, it's pretty fast. I'm gonna um, access another data set, another elevation data set you may be familiar with, bathymetric data uh, distributed, the Geb Jebco data set. So um, you see, now it comes with uh, a land, this is a net CDF file. Um, it comes with some land cover as well. I think it's the STLR um, uh, elevations. And that's populating the, the cells as well at the same time. So I can query, if I right click here, I've act, I'm getting two elevations on the land. One's from the GTOPOS 30, the other one's from the shuttle um, uh, elevation data. And you can see there's a significant difference there. And if I go over to the ocean, there's no elevation except for the bathymetric data that Jetcos has. So we're integrating these data on the fly from these different sources. We can bring in, I've got some LIDAR data that I, I can bring in as well. This is kind of emphasize this. Um, just some bare earth LIDAR. And it's just a tile in uh, the area where I live, down in here. So we're integrating all of that data you can, you'll see this coming in on the fly here. And so now we have four elevation data sets all being integrated in those cells. I could put the image back on if, you're, if you forget, these are just cells on the ground. And this is all being rendered on the fly, integrating all the data sets at this different resolution. This is what data integration is all about. Now the power for the non-GIS user is they just have to know the names of the data sets and they can just start bringing them in. They don't have to worry about projections and data formats and things like that. So I'll just take some of these data sets off for now so we don't have too many on here and I'll add some vector data. So we still have the elevation data. Let's add the uh, uh, basic data world uh, property boundary data set. Now this is rasterizing these vectors on the fly, just like a graphics card takes a vector and th there's an algorithm called a Bechingham method that it uses in the graphics processing pipeline. And so you see on the screen um, a straight line if it's a vector, but really you've pixelated it into the graphics card. Essentially we have a hexagonal graphics card that's you know built in here. And so if I zoom down on this fast enough, you'll see that you might be seeing the hexagons there um, because it's just a hex grid of, of this line work. But these are this is just a shape file and I can select um, the shape file here. This is Alberta, the province that I was born in in Canada. And it tells me, um, on the sphere, uh, 672,570 kilometers squared is that that's the area uh, based on those pixels. And uh, it also tells me the average elevation, 773.541. So we can do min, max, all the statistical analysis on there. And I can sub select uh, the elevations. I, I might be just interested in in those elevations that I can sub-select and do further analysis. 
And then let's bring in some more data here. I might want to have in Canada, we have, uh, well, here's a, a pop. This is coming from, from uh, Columbia University. It's a, a web coverage service that has the gridded population data. Um, so that's coming in here now. And um, so you can see the little specs that are showing up here. And if I go back to my original selection of Alberta, it will tell me um, that the average elevate or average population is 4.641 people. And if I multiply that by this area, then you would get the population of Alberta, obviously. So it's been normalized. You know, and I, I you could believe me, why don't we go over to Estonia and check its population out here and on the fly. Now this may not work, you know what demonstrations are like. So I, I, I forgive me if I, I think this is it right here. Yep, yep. Beautiful area. Um, and I'm going to select it here. Now I think these pop, this population is from 1990. Ooh, but okay. if somebody has a calculator with them, they could do a calculation 33 points, boy, more population density than Alberta, 33.672 times 46,813, about 1, 1.4, 1.5 million. Roughly, right now, officially, it's 1.2 uh, million, roughly. Hmm? You can see how easily this, this works. You know, we can add, um, you know, other types of data. Here now, let's see if I have uh, so land cover data for the Earth. Right. And uh, now this is coming in as numbers, but I actually have the uh, the the legend here because I I wanted to work out something ahead of time. Um, number fourteen is cropland natural vegetation and five is mixed forest. So you have mostly mixed forest. You have 24,583 square kilometers of mixed forest, lots of forest. Yeah, people think it's half the country, it's forest, but there's now lots of logging going on, but, but this is a whole different story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, we can, um, uh, let's see what I'm looking at here. We could- Can you check, check 11? Can I, sorry, can I interrupt you right now? Why sure. you edit? Can you, can you look at 11? 11 was permanent wetlands. Uh, yeah, 11. 11 was permanent wetland. Yeah, so let me just select that again. I think one of the things about this, let, let's just do some, this is a raw data set that I've just brought in. So it, it doesn't really know much about what I'm trying to do. So let's just put some values right. in. Okay, I hope I didn't pull you off too much now. No, not at all, no. <laughs> I think we'll see something now anyway, so. There we go. And I'll just pull this, uh, I'll just make this maybe black, let's see. So let's just do that selection again. We're in this area, right? Mm -hmm. So Estonia and pick it. And uh, what was the, do you remember? 11. 11, yeah. 683 square kilometers. Uh, uh, mm. 683 square kilometers. That doesn't sound like very much. Yeah, that's, uh, so Estonia has lots of bogs. And I think Canada also does have a lot of bogs. We can actually find out where they are at. I'll just sub-select on that number 11. And uh, there they are showing up there. Mm -hmm. I can tell you how much rain is falling there as well today. And the intensity of rain. So we can do things like generate a watershed. Um, uh, I don't, I'm going to guess here that there's some river that's coming into this lake area. Um, uh, try, yeah. Let me see here. All 
probably the boundary of the country, yeah? Mm. So it will select the best elevation and um, let's see what happens. If you go there, then you will get a lot of Russia. Oh, you will. there you go. There's the watershed. Yeah, because for this Lake Papsi, which is this really lake, big lake, uh, you have actually lots of, oh, interesting. Wow. So that is immediately the watershed, yeah? Yeah, so we could find out if we had, we can check the population there too, or we could just select the Estonia part of that watershed. Let's just see here. It look, looks about, it looks feasible. Mm. So I'll just sub-select. So this is the part of the drainage basin. That's yeah. it. Does that look right? Quite about it right? looks. It looks sort of feasible. Mm. Okay. So no magic there, but that's what the DDGSs do. <laughs> Thanks, Perry. Right. Okay. And I see Matt showed up, so I can just kind of pass it over to him. And <laughs> nice cool. to see you. Uh, I'm, uh, my sincerest apologies as um, uh, this one's going to be uh, very much flying by the seat of my pants. It's, uh, <laughs> it's no, no worries. Good. It's great to have you and, and um, I mean, coordinating this across the globe with it now in Canada. Are you in Australia, I guess, right now? Yeah, yeah. What's, what's the time in your place? It's uh, just coming up to 6 p.m. I mean, thank you again also for putting in <laughs> this no unorthodox schedule. Well, compared to some of the telecons I've been doing the last um, week or so, this is this is good. <laughs> cool, Perry. Whenever you you you, you, know, you, I, you, you might finish as, as as smoothly as you want, so Ed, you don't have to immediately stop. <laughs> yeah. So this is just. Uh, I I think I've given you the idea. Data integration getting data so that people can use it and ask questions. You know, we have school children using this. It's, but this is, you know, you can use it for scientific analysis. We've, we've doing, there's some great videos you can watch on um, data modeling, climate change. Uh, we did a slope analysis to try to find where there, there'd be slope stability problems when um, permafrost left the North and really quite simple. There was one study, that particular study took four months to do with conventional Esri software. I didn't even know what I was doing. It took me about two hours. <laughs> because the data was immediately available. So because it just you know, it when in. you think of it, probably most of you here listening would, would relate to this. Data integration is, is like, is, after acquiring data is our most expensive step. And in we're using DGGS, it's a free operation and we get to start having fun right away. We can just start using data values. Okay, that's kind of my little spiel. I hope that, that helped. Any questions for me? If not immediately, so we can always do it like this. You guys can um, put questions in the chat or raise your hand or just jump in. Um, I think we can still try to do it quite quite casual. Um, otherwise, you can also ask emails, uh, ask questions per email later afterwards. Um, I think all the all the um, presenters are, are very open to to uh, responses to to those yeah. those inquiries. Yeah, and and freely uh, share my email address. If there's others that would like to contact me and and know more. Yeah, cool. Thanks a lot, Perry. That was that was really great. And it's this is particular for this topic, the global grid systems. It's it's nice to see some something smooth and, and well operating already. Whereas uh, you know all the all the hype with with Uber is where you still have to code everything yourself. I mean, you have to if you want to code it, but if you don't want to code it, there's not you know there's not yet so much available really. <laughs>